Thank you very much. Um, I'll get a timer going so that I don't overstay my welcome. Um, so the assignment uh, that we were all given for these talks is to give a series of, of book reviews that you ought to all read. Um, but I think though not explicitly mentioned uh, in the assignment, there was also, ah, oh, thank you. Very helpful. There was also the, uh, the unspoken assumption that I would uh, try to do this in such a way that you're not put to sleep by my series of reviews. So in order to keep it interesting, um, I thought it would be helpful to have like an organizing principle that would kind of hold the same the whole thing together. I think Jared did did the same thing, um, but uh, I I went much narrower with my organizing principle. My idea was to grab a stack of Doug's books um, and to try to make a larger argument out of uh, his works. So this will make it really awkward and uh, for Doug to sit through. And he, at the end, he can get up and just say, no, that's not it. <laughs> um, anyhow, so it, it, this is a, um, a larger argument about, I think, what is going on in Moscow. So I'm, I'm using Doug's books to kind of put this all together, but it's, it's a larger argument about what's going on in Mos Moscow. Some of the um, overarching or underlying themes uh, in the Moscow mojo, and I'll note, I think we're more of a mojo than a mood. So Moscow mojo, this is kind of a reading list for that, I suppose. Um, now, I want to start not with one of Doug's books, but with the, the magazine that was back at the beginning of everything here in Moscow, Credenda Agenda. Um, really quick, I'm going to uh, steal from Jared and ask you guys to raise your hand. Raise your hand if you um, ever had a print subscription to Credenda Agenda. I'm just curious, really quick. Okay, just interesting. Okay, so... Um, Credenda started as a newsletter, I think around 1989. It became a magazine and then a web page, which lasted until I think 2013 when Doug's blog became the main vehicle for his writing. Um, Doug was the editor of Credenda Agenda and over the years, the driving contributor, though many of us also piled in at different times. Credenda Agenda was through the 90s and the 2000s, the way that um, most people got introduced to Moscow. It was known for a lot of things, including being an early vessel for what uh, Kevin DeYoung has recently called that Moscow mood, that sort of rhetorical spice. Uh, that's where it, it first was born and, um, and kind of um, got its sea legs. Um, a number of later canon books started as articles from Credenda Agenda. If you piled up all of one column, you'd discover, oh wait, that was a Canon Press book later on. And also a number of Moscow authors got their first start uh, in writing in Credenda Agenda. So it was kind of like an early Moscow proving ground uh, for writers and teachers and whatnot. But the thing that I want to comment on from the old pages of Credenda Agenda is simply the title. Credenda Agenda. There's, there's something there that I think a lot of people um, have not really caught on to, a, a pun that was going on. Um, given that the magazine was started in 1989, back when uh, Doug was in the early uh, building stages of Logos School and developing um, the curriculum that would become the model for classical Christian education, I think it's unsurprising that he went uh, for a Latin pun for the title of the magazine. Uh, and there's something that's going on there. The title is derived from two Latin verbs. The first is credo, which, it, which means in Latin, I believe, credo, uh, I believe from the infinitive credere. Um, and the second is ago, which means I, I, I put into motion, I cause it to start going. Um, and uh, from the Latin verb agere. Um, for the title, credenda agenda, these two verbs, credo and ago, are both put into their, um, their pa future passive participle. Okay, and they're, they're plural future passive partici participles. Um, credere into credenda. Um, and agere into agenda. That's the, um, that's the form it's being put into. And it's significant because the, the future passive participle takes the idea of the action of the verb and it turns it into something that you ought to do. Something that you ought to do. So um, a, a, a credenda then would be, because it's plural, it would be things that you ought to believe. Credo is to believe and credenda would be things that you ought to believe. Um, agenda from ago to put something into motion agenda becomes things that you ought to do 
And you, you know the word agenda uh, in the English language, and that's where it comes from. It's the Latin from ago, and it's things that you ought to do. So a credenda agenda, then, is things you ought to believe and things that you ought to do. Okay, Things you ought to believe and things that you ought to do. The title, Credenda Agenda, then implied that there are things that we ought to believe and that innately connected to those items of our faith, there is a divinely given agenda for us. There's some stuff that we're supposed to go out and do. And while also being a a clever bit of Latin punning, the title actually, I think, profoundly summarizes the arc of what I'd like to pull out of this series of Doug's books. Um, There is what must be believed, um, primarily the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then there is an agenda for the world that the gospel gives to us. Okay, so get just get that pattern um, clear in your mind, and you'll start to see this kind of everywhere as I'm working through this. Um, the first book that I want to start with then is his 2013 book, Against the Church. Um, 2013, Against the Church. I'm starting here not because this book is at the beginning, but because its focus is on something that I think is at the foundation of Doug's work, namely a defense of a robust doctrine of regeneration, Uh, the old school, evangelical, personal, individual regeneration. Uh, The title, Against the Church, might sound like it is leaning against his 2001 book, Mother Kirk. So you've got Mother Kirk, and then you've got against the church. Sounds like they're kind of pushing against each other. Um, and just to put them in historical perspective, Mother Kirk was published in 2001, which was just on the eve of the whole Federal Vision controversy. So the Auburn Avenue Conference that kicked that whole thing off is in January of 2002. So 2001, Mother Kirk comes out. And then against the church comes in uh, in 2013 as the whole controversy is winding down. So those two books are kind of useful parentheses around that controversy. Against the church is divided into four, um, four sections, with the first section providing the bulk of what you would expect from the title, namely an assessment of the pitfalls of uh, liturgy, sacrament, tradition, doctrine, etc. But it's important to note that he's actually just um, he's warning of, of pitfalls, not critiquing their existence. And this is where you start to see Mother Kirk and Against the Church are really saying the same thing. They're just kind of rhetorically framed a little bit differently, but they're, they're getting at the same thing. Here's a, a quote from Against the Church. Liturgy without life is like putting makeup on a corpse. All right, liturgy without life is like putting a makeup on a corpse. Um, you have to realize that's clearly not actually a critique of liturgy. It's a critique of lifeless liturgy, or what I'd go on to argue, liturgy without regeneration on the inside. The critique isn't a critique of liturgy. It's a critique of lifeless liturgy. liturgy. And he does this with each of these categories. I think his main argument then can be summed up here. Another quote from Against the Church. In all the sacred things that we are against, we find the same error coming up again and again. Are we using liturgy as a mural or a window? Are we staring at it or are we looking through it? Um, But in the third section of the book, Doug argues for the necessity of the the evangelical doctrine of personal individual regeneration. A man must be born again. And Doug continues to argue in the fourth section of the book that this doctrine of individual regeneration is at at the heart of what it means to be an evangelical. Um, Now, it's funny that I think Doug so strongly identifies himself uh, as an evangelical in Against the Church in 2013, when in the previous year, 2012, he published Even Jellyfish, which is a a satirical send-up of uh, the the evangelical world, and one that uh, won Christianity Today's Best Fiction Award for 2012. But you can tell in Against the Church that Doug is fundamentally an evangelical, and the blows thrown at evangelicalism in Even Jellyfish and elsewhere are the wax of an older brother trying to get his younger brother to quit being embarrassing. Um, You might remember if you've read um, Even Jellyfish, uh, uh, I think it's... um, in the, the very last word in the um, second to last chapter is the word, uh, if I, I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing, I might need to get Doug to do this later, but the word is thrubba-dubba. Um, and and uh, thrubba-dubba is the, is the ends the chapter, and thrubba-dubba is meant to be the sound of the beginning of a new regenerate heart working in the chest of Chad Lester, uh, the, the skis ball pastor in the novel. 
Um, so you've got, it, it's a send up of the evangelical world, but at the heart of it again is this hope of uh, regeneration. And that's kind of almost like the resolution of the whole story is that individual regeneration. Here's one more quote from Against the Church. I'm not returning uh, to anything while I am uh, not a Baptist. I'm not returning to anything while I'm not a Baptist at all, though I like them fine. I am an evangelical. I have always been an evangelical. And when this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, it will be the tongue of a dead evangelical. Okay, so, so I've got this, this establishment of a strong doctrine of personal regeneration. Next, I want to d- jump back to Doug's introduction to the eschatology of postmillennialism. Um, Heaven Misplaced was published in 2008, um, and this is this is I think the place where you get the most concise or thorough argument for the doctrine of, of postmillennialism. Uh, it's it's dedicated. The the book is dedicated to my brother-in-law, <clears throat> excuse me, Luke Jankovic. Luke had come to NSA from the Dutch Reformed ghettos of Chicago, and coming from an all-mill world, was struck by how postmillennialism uh, was ever present in every facet of life in Moscow, and what a significant impact. Uh, it had made. Doug summarizes the post-millennial position like this. This is the view that the gospel will continue to grow and flourish throughout the world. More and more individuals will be converted. The nations will stream to Christ and the the great commission will finally be successfully completed. The earth will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And when that happens, generation after generation will love and serve the Lord faithfully. And then the end will come heaven misplaced. Um, From here he proceeds to supply an exegetical outline of the post-millennial eschatology, but I want to highlight one argument that I think is essential to Doug's post-millennialism. And it's that quote that I just read. Um, um, There's one word that that Doug, and if you read Doug's writings, he always like will throw in italics to let you know this is the thing that's kind of important. There's one word that is italicized in that quote that I gave you, and that word is successfully successfully. Here, listen to the sentence again. This is the view that the gospel will continue to grow and flourish throughout the world. More and more individuals will be converted. The nations will stream to Christ and the great commission will finally be successfully completed, right? Successfully. Um, I think that, and this is important for you to understand. I think that in Doug's view, the strongest argument for the post-millennial position is that it portrays a successful gospel, this, this is the gospel actually working. People's objections about the gospel are actually answered in post-millennialism. Um, I think this is why Doug is fond of answering Arminian arguments from John's language about Jesus being savior of the world. Okay, you, you get John constantly referring to Jesus being savior of the world, and the Calvinists and the Arminians both have to do gymnastics around how is it that it says he saved the world, but he isn't really. Um, the gospel does actually save the world, not a hypothetical world, but the actual world. And the doctrine of postmillennialism shows how the gospel which regenerates individual hearts doesn't stay there, but flows out such that the whole world will be saved. Um, This argument is about the actual salvation of the world and how this makes everyone's problem passages go away. Um, and it's and that argument is saved for the epilogue of heaven misplaced. In other words, this is the argument that he uses to close the whole book. And I think it's there at the end because this is this is really significant. Um, if you ever if you ever get Doug um, arguing either soteriology or eschatology with anyone, you'll know that he's going to go here. He, he'll he'll always go there because I think this is at the center of it. Postmillennialism is what makes the gospel. It's the one portrayal of the gospel where the gospel works and it accomplishes all the things that Scripture um, describes it as being in, intended to address. So it's, it's a successful gospel. Um, now, I picked these two, works, uh, two books to start with, Against the Church and Heaven Misplaced, because they establish a theme that I think forms an interesting thread through Doug's works. Um, and that is an evangelical commitment to the doctrine of individual regeneration and a post-millennialist hope that this generation flows out to renew the whole world. Okay, This thing that goes on inside, in your heart, spiritual regeneration that flows out into the objective historical world and changes the world uh, around us. I think that these two themes then form the credenda and the agenda that I want to trace through the rest of the, the works that I want to address. There's the credenda, 
Um, that thing that must be believed, the heart-transforming gospel of Jesus Christ. And then there's the agenda, the irresistible flow of that gospel out of individual hearts into the world, transforming it. Um, and I think it's important to note that the post-millennialism is, is an agenda and not an addenda. More Latin punning, sorry. Um, it's an agenda, not an addenda. What I mean is that the success of the gospel is not a simple add-on. It's not like, here's this, oh, and there's also this. It's, it's not just something, something that is simply added on, but it's an essential quality of the gospel. Here's the gospel, and now if the gospel is going to really succeed and do what it says, it's, there's this agenda that flows out from it and changes the whole world. The gospel is an effective gospel because it regenerates hearts, and those regenerate hearts then regenerate the world, the world all around us. Um, one of Doug's main um, arguments for the postmillennial position is that um, the one eschatology where the gospel, it, it is the one eschatology where the gospel is successful um, in delivering what Jesus claimed in uh, the Great Commission, where we're told to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey. Postmillennialism takes that seriously and says this gospel accomplishes what it says. To put it another way, grace, then, grace has an agenda. Okay, hopefully catch the significance of the naming of this whole event, because grace has an agenda. Um, to be sure, then, uh, be, be sure to catch the trajectory of credenda agenda, because you will start to see it showing up everywhere once you start to see it that way. Specifically, the trajectory that I'm singling out is the insistence on individual regeneration and then an ins insistence that that work of the Spirit flow out and become outwardly manifest. It's going, it's going to flow out and become manifest. This shows up elsewhere, and I want to start looking, first of all, at Doug, uh, Doug's Doctrine of the Church as an example of this. And the best place to look for this is to go back to that 2001 book, uh, Mother Kirk. Mother Kirk, I, if you haven't read that one, I, I highly recommend that to sort of situate everything that, that is kind of you see coming out of Moscow. Mother Kirk was actually first the title of a chapter in Angels and the Architecture, uh, which Doug co-wrote with Doug Jones and was published in 1998, um, so three years before Mother Kirk. So first, it's a chapter in Angels and the Architecture, then it becomes a book itself three years later. And, and in that book, Mother Kirk, I think, um, um, it unpacks that earlier chapter and does the work to establish the Protestant ecclesiology on which the worldview that's described back in Angels in the Architecture could sit. So Angels in the Architecture describes a sort of Protestant medieval worldview. And then Mother Kirk says, okay, if you want that kind of world, this is, this is the ecclesiology that makes sense of that and that, that is the foundation for that. It's the spade work necessary to make the Angels in the Architecture worldview work. In Mother Kirk, Doug begins with a, a reaffirmation of his insistence on individual regeneration. Here's a quote. The reformation of the church begins with individuals. It will be as individuals that we will appear before the bar of God to be gathered with the sheep or scattered with the goats. So he starts off with that um, insistence. But Doug notes that the doctrine of internal individual regeneration has had a tendency to pit evangelical Christians against the earthly, um, visible, historic church. Okay? So this doctrine of individual regeneration, which he's affirming, has tended to make um, evangelicals somehow pit regeneration against this, this visible church that we see around us now. Um, the, uh, the, the earthly, visible, historic church. Not because the doctrine of regeneration was wrong, but because the evangelicals' doctrine of the church is deficient. It's not that the, the doctrine of regeneration is just fine, it's that our doctrine of the church is deficient. And that's, I think, why Mother Kirk is being penned. Evangelical Reformed Christians, Christians have traditionally distinguished between the invisible church and the visible church, theological categories uh, we get from the 16th century. The visible church and the invisible church. The invisible church corresponds to the internal spiritual reality, and the visible church corresponds to the external physical uh, church that is revealed to our senses. In Mother Kirk, Doug argues that by setting these two churches next to one another like this, one can't help but be prompted to prioritize the invisible church um, because that's where the elect are. All the elect are in the invisible church. So you tend to prioritize the invisible church over the visible church because that's where all the hypocrites are. Okay? If being in the visible church doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Being in the invisible church means that you are. So it's, it's pretty obvious that you're going to prioritize this one over that one. 
So he proposes alternative categories of the historical and the eschatological church. The historical church then being the objective, visible church that we are all a part of. Right? That's the historical church that we're all sitting around and we can objectively see it, be members of it, and be part of it. And then the eschatological church being the final state of this church when we are all gathered to the, um, in glory. In one sense, these two roughly map onto the visible church and the invisible church, right? To say historical, you're re referring to the visible church. To refer to eschatological, you're talking about that invisible church. But by placing them um, end to end like this, historical through time, and then it culminates in glory and eschatological, by placing them end to end like that, we're no longer tempted to choose between the two of them as we were when, when the two were put side by side. Okay, this is visible and invisible, but this is historical culminating in the eschatological. By making it in time, they're, they're, not, um, they're not opposed to one another. You don't have to pick one over the other. Not just that you're, you're not tempted to pick one over the other, but you start to now see the historical church as the pathway to take me to that eschatological church. I want to be here because I want to be there, right? This is taking me there. I want to be here because I want to be there. Um, this provides a platform for Mother Kirk to then advance the case for the visible elements of the historical church. Sacraments, liturgy, Sabbatarianism, church polity. This is when a lot of this stuff was getting worked out in Moscow as we became a more liturgically oriented church, um, weekly communion, all those sorts of things. This is all being worked out this time. But as I noted at the beginning, this is an ecclesiology that flows out of hearts transformed by the gospel. And you should also note the prevalence of... Um, the post-millennial agenda in this ecclesiology. I mean, it's, it's, it's right there in, in the words. You've got the historical church and the eschatological church. The, it, it's eschatology, it's post-millennialism. It's this going uh, to there. Uh, the church militant, another way this has been described, the church militant, the church historical, is headed towards the church triumphant, the church ecclesiastical, or <laughs> sorry, eschatological. It is an ecclesiology that's driven by an eschatology. Okay? It's an ecclesiology that's driven by an eschatology. Regenerate hearts situated in a visible church, historical church with a physical liturgy and sacraments, with a historical tradition, and with an earthly mission in which it is promised a future success. Okay? That's what he's describing. And you'll notice that this was a vision that found um, objections to it on either side in the early 2000s. And, and I want you to note where the object, objections come from because as I establish this kind of credenda agenda, you'll also see what, what um, end up being the ditches on either side or the critiques from either side that, that come in each of these categories. Um, this is, there's a lot of inside baseball that's here going on here, but to massively oversimplify, and I confess this is a massive oversimplification, on the one hand, when, when you had this, this description of the church, of Mother Kirk, on the one hand, you had the TR crowd, um, the, the truly reformed crowd, that objected to the emphasis on the objectivity of the covenant. You're saying this is historical, it's visible, it's this objectivity of the covenant, this stuff is all right in front of you. There was a TR crowd that wanted um, to emphasize that internal regeneration and got nervous when too much credence was given to, the, um, to this, this um, covenant that was objective. Uh, they, saw, um, they, saw, um, they saw that as a popery, okay? You're, you're putting too much influence on this visible church. On the other side, you also had the far sort of dark v f, f the, sorry the dark fv crowd that disagreed with Doug's clinging to an evangelical doctrine of regeneration which seemed like baptist mumbo jumbo hanging on on the inside it was a position then that was shot at from all from all sides which means probably that he was on to something um, so, so you had the, this, this historical and eschatological church this credenda and an agenda um, and then and then you had on one side, a critique that, that wanted to keep everything on the inside, the subjective interior, and another crit, um, critique on the other side that didn't like the subjectivity of the interior and wanted just the, uh, the objective external. But I think that Doug would refuse to pick. 
So t I want you to see the tying together of the credenda and the agenda, an evangelical faith that must necessarily flow out of that heart into the physical and historical world and change and transform that world. And in Mother Kirk, the world that's flowing out into is the visible church, the historic church, our liturgy and covenant renewal ceremony on Sunday morning. On the one, um, and then notice the tendency for this, his, this position to provoke objections from both sides. On the one hand, you will get those that want to privilege the internal evangelical faith because of its spiritual superiority. And on the other hand, you'll get those that want to privilege the external physical reality because of its objectivity. Okay, there's the two tensions. I think Doug just refuses to pick between those two and insists that they rely on one another. Now, with the pattern that I've established, um, in the, in the realm of, uh, of ecclesiology, I want to turn now to Doug's 2003 book, The Case for Classical Christian Education. This, this follows his first book on the subject, Recovering the Lost Tools of Learning. So uh, Case for Classical Education um, is 2003. Recovering Lost Tools of Learning is 1991. That's the, one, that's the book that like, launched the whole um, classical Christian education movement. And then in between, there's a number of, of other books that follow up uh, on the subject of classical Christian education. But I want to look at the case for classical Christian education. Um, the book ranges widely covering topics like um, the trivium, the role of athletics, dress codes, uh, the history of Logos school, etc. But I wanted to pick this one because there's something very similar about this text to Mother Kirk. Okay, and that's the interesting thing to take the case for classical Christian education and say, how is this like Mother Kirk? What's the, the similarity in the pattern here? On the one hand, you have pragmatic advice for building an educational institution. And that institution is situated in and committed to inculcating a much larger Western intellectual tradition. Um, on the other hand, in the case for classical Christian education, Doug articulates a driving force for this institution, uh, this institution building that is rooted in old school evangelical faith. Um, if, you, if you get the book in the first third, um, there's a chapter that's called What is Education? Immediately before the chapter on what is education, which is where he's like defining what education is, immediately before that is a chapter called The Centrality of Worship. Centrality of Worship. Now step back for a moment, and um, because I think it's very strange to have a book on education that includes a chapter arguing for the centrality of worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Like what, what, does, that, what, do you, what does that chapter doing in a book that's supposed to be on pedagogy? Why does the articulation of a classical pedagogy need to address the topic of worship? Um, Doug explains, this is a quote from that book, the main reason worship is central concerns the children. Worship is the point of all integration, uh, all integration for all Christian living, including the living that goes on at the school. When children who are members of the race, homo adorans, worship God rightly, everything comes together in their lives. When they do not, everything is out of joint. Okay, um, the, that, that line, homo adorans, it's, um, it's juxtaposing homo adorans is worshiping man as opposed to homo sapiens, thinking man. All right, there, this is, he's stealing from Jim Jordan here where th this was an argument he makes that man is, is fundamentally, what, what distinguishes us from the animals is not that we think. What makes us um, human is that we are designed to worship God. We, we were made for the end of serving God in worship, and Doug is taking that that homo adorans and saying this is the this is the goal of education. This is where all education is going. So if your pedagogy isn't oriented towards leading students into worship of the Triune God, then you're missing what the whole thing was for. Let me, let me continue with another quote from him. As children are given a thoroughly and distinctively Christian education, they will understand the world God placed them in, and they will understand their appointed role in it. They will learn to grow in their sanctification, whether intellectual, ethical, or aesthetic, and as we teach them their identity in Christ in such a way that they embrace that identity and the terms of the covenant that define it, they will provide the kind of contrast with our postmodern culture's lost children that will make evangelism truly potent. Before we can invite non-believers to participate in our believing culture, we have to have one. And in order to have one, we have to pass the faith on to our children in spirit and truth. Um, notice that the end point that he is aiming at here is actually evangelical. Um, passing on the faith in spirit and in truth. Like really regenerate hearts. That's the goal is to push that out. The final goal is regenerate hearts. Or actually, to be more accurate, the final goal is regenerate hearts gathered around the throne of Lord Jesus Christ, worshiping him. Um, and Doug ends this book with his own educational creed. And here's a, um, a line from that. 
As Christian educators, we are to understand first who God is in His triune sovereignty, and secondly, what He has done in the history of the created order, the creation, in the incarnation, and in the final glory. In the light of who God is and what He has done, true education is possible. Outside that light, all attempts at education are fundamentally idolatrous and self-contradictory. I believe that true education is a process of aiding baptized children to grow in their sanctification as they seek to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength as God commands, and to love their neighbors as themselves. So the goal for, here for classical Christian education is purely evangelical, right? And, and yet the task at hand is the building of institutions with dress codes, uh, reading lists, football teams, accreditation, boards, policy manuals, and other bureaucratic trappings, all things that the book goes on to address. And these institutions will be committed not to daily Bible studies and altar calls, but to the inculcation of their students in the larger Western intellectual tradition, the trivium, the quadrivium, the liberal arts. Why? An, excuse me, another quote from him. I believe that every form of cultural egalitarianism is at the root a lie and is therefore mischievous in its effects on education. In the providence of God, the history of the kingdom of God and the history of the Western civilization are intertwined. Born during the reign of Caesar Augustus, the Lord Jesus Christ sent out his apostles and emissaries to preach his gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. The first 2,000 years of their obedience were spent largely to the north and west of Israel, and this has had cultural and historical consequences. This statement is not a cultural vaunt or boast, but is rather a recognition that the gospel and only the gospel displays such cultural power. I believe, therefore, that a truly Christian education will, with gratitude, emphasize the heritage of the West. Now, notice again two things from this. On the one hand, this is old school evangelical. We want regenerate hearts gathered around the gospel. But on the other hand, this means that, um, that to this end, uh, the, the means to this end are institution building inside of a historical intellectual tradition. The gospel flows out of regenerate hearts into the world and it creates a visible culture and institutions around it. And lovers of the gospel ought to claim and own that culture. That, that cultural heritage that has been flowing out and building, we should claim and own it. Um, I think that you have here the same tension that you saw in Mother Kirk, a credenda and an agenda. You have a gospel, and then you have the biblical worldview that flows out of the gospel and serves the gospel, transforming the world. And I would say in this classical world, you have detractors on both sides. On, on the one hand, you have, you have biblicists that object to the idea of widening the scope of education to the Western tradition. Uh, they reject Doug's, Doug's argument that the West was disproportionately shaped by the gospel and therefore should be studied as gospel fruit. Stop reading um, Homer, stop reading Aristotle. We just want to be um, focused on our Bible studies and be biblicists. On the other hand, you get proponents of classical education who are happy to minimize the Christian part. Okay, so the first folks say we need Christian education, not classical. Get, get rid of this external culture stuff. We just want um, Christian. That's one critique from one side. But then you have on the other side this critique that says um, let's, let's lean into the classical, but you can have the classical and you can minimize the Christian. Okay, they want the external Western culture part, but not the engine of Christian worship that created that culture. They want the culture that came out of it, but they don't want the engine that actually uh, grew it. Um, they want the external Western culture, but not the engine of Christian worship that created that culture. Um, conveniently, conveniently, this move of dropping Christian out and keeping the classical side, so you just you drop out the Christian and hang on to the classical, conveniently, that gets your charter school funded uh, by the state. Um, when you do that, you know, there's a lot of government money if you're willing to make that, that move. I'm sure that's not why they do it. It's just a happy coincidence. Um, <laughs> but, but my point here is that Doug's vision for classical Christian education is not a miscellaneous side hustle, but actually a clear extension of a particular project of credenda and agenda. Think for a moment of the whole Christian nationalism debate, and you can see the same tension once again. The goal here is to have a bunch of regenerate people aiming to live in a nation which acknowledges the lordship of Jesus Christ and starts to pass laws that reflect and honor the law of God um, such that the sphere of law would be conformed to the character of the triune God. 
Credenda and Agenda. I'm picking uh, Mere Christendom here, which was published last year to represent Doug's position on, the, on this question. Um, and you have the same detractors here uh, when, when, you, when you hit Christian nationalism, and I'm starting to abbreviate uh, these a little bit so that we end on time. Um, you have the same detractors here on each side of Doug's position on Christian nationalism. On the one hand, you have um, Christians horrified at the idea of a state becoming explicitly Christianized. You have, you have Christians who, who are horrified at the idea that the state might become explicitly con, um, Christianized. They want internal regeneration, but they're, they're horrified by the idea of that, that internal regeneration flowing out and influencing our nation's law. Um, I get it when Baptists object to this. I do, because I, I get there's an internal consistency there, but it really is funny watching Presbyterians getting worked up over the idea of a Christian nation. Um, that's just kind of funny to me. As Doug writes in Mere Christendom, there's a quote from there, everyone who subscribes to the Westminster uh, Confession of Faith is a Christian nationalist. That's, this, is, this is right there in your, in your creeds and in your confessions. Um, then on the other hand, you have people, so, so you've got people who don't want regeneration flowing out and affecting our, our state government. On the other hand, you have people thinking that the advance of Christian nationalism does not depend on the advance of gospel preaching, but simply the act of passing good legislation. Um, if you caught Doug on Tucker Carlson, I think that that was an important moment where he said, without gospel preaching revival, we don't have a hope for a Christian nation. It has to be gospel preaching revival that leads us to that. You can't establish it with just voting in the right laws. Christian nationalism, or at least the Christian nationalism that Doug is advocating, depends on internal regeneration, and I would say a whole lot of it. Um, so again, a credenda of faith followed by an agenda of reforming your nation's laws to reflect the law of God. However, one thing that you should note is that mere Christendom is not the same thing as Christian nationalism. That book, though it, it, it gives you an argument that helps you to understand Christian nationalism, it's actually not an, the book itself is not um, Christian nationalism. Mere Christendom and Christian nationalism are different things. Um, Christian nationalism is aimed at a single nation, whereas mere Christendom is aiming at the whole world. It's just that the world is um, made up of nations, and so considering the world as nations is a useful way of dividing up our post-millennial to-do list. Um, when a, what I mean by this is reforming marriage addresses us as married couples and walks us through how to be obedient in our marriages. But the goal of reforming marriage wasn't to provide advice to one single couple, but to give a pattern uh, for all faithful marriages to follow. So mere Christendom is not aimed solely at returning America to its Christian roots, but rather at turning every nation to bow the knee and kiss the son lest he be angry. Uh, here's a quote from mere Christendom. Mere Christendom is not Christian nationalism. Mere Christendom is the sum total of lots of smaller Christian nationalisms. Uh, and then this is me. Uh, if America were a uh, Christian tonight, a Christian nationalist might be happy, but a proponent of mere Christendom would wake up and start raising money for sending missionaries to Canada. Um, now, once you see this, this trajectory, I think you start to see it in much of Doug's work. The family series of reforming marriage, standing on the promises, federal husband, all ones that I would say are essential, um, are, are all aimed at building the smaller institution of the family with the primary building material, again, being regenerate hearts. Um, it's practical advice for very, very small institution building, the small institutions being all the various families. But that advice always begins with regenerate hearts. In fact, I would say that most of the, Doug's advice is not helpful unless ye be born again. Um, it starts with the gospel changing a heart and then it flows out to change the whole world. So my summary is that Doug's project and essentially the larger Moscow project is the evangelical gospel lit on fire by post-millennialism. Um, and as I argued earlier, that, that post-mill fire is not an optional addition thrown on for fun, um, but a realization of what it means for the gospel to truly accomplish what was promised in the gospel. It's the fulfillment of the gospel itself. If Jesus Christ is a savior of the world, and he is, then the world must be saved, and we, his servants, must be about the work of advancing that end. Now, I've only mentioned a handful of Doug's books here, but I think I have provided a framework in which the vast majority of them could be situated. I think if you, if you laid those categories out, um, you, you can situate him in, in my outline. Um, However, I, I do think there's one subset of Doug's uh, oeuvre which is still missing, and that is a subset that I think um, 
the, the subset that provokes much of the wailing about the Moscow Mojo. Um, namely, the eagerness to lean into the conflict, um, the deliberate uh, provoc uh, provocation, the deciding to pick a rhetorical line that will provoke when the giving of offense could have been dodged. Okay, um, uh, Doug's Serrated Edge was published in 2003 and makes plain his rhetorical strategy. Um, I think that the book is problematic if you're trying to defend Doug sometime by saying something like, oh, I don't think he meant that or that offense was unintentional. No, he meant it. <laughs> he wrote a whole book about it. this is what I'm trying to do. So he doesn't have that alibi. Um, he meant it. He intended it. He wrote a book, uh, a whole book about it 20 years ago. It's all on purpose. Um, so how does the serrated edge fit into this credenda agenda that I'm outlining? Well, the thing that I think you should notice is that Doug's project here is not theoretical. And, and, and you really have to catch that. It's not theoretical. It's not an academic exercise. Um, we're not talking about some ideas that we have. We're fleshing out, seeing is this consistent with this, and how would we footnote that? We're talking about an actual, um, an actual project that, that we want to actually happen. I remember having lunch a few years ago with the previous mayor of Moscow. And he mentioned Doug's ambition of making Moscow a Christian town. And he was shaking his head and saying, it's ridiculous. It will never happen. And, and, and he was kind of just disgusted by the whole thing. He thought it was a daydream or a talking point for the donors or something like that. But I don't think he understood how incredibly seriously we take this. That, that this is not just a, a plan somewhere. This is something we're trying to do. We're trying to actually advance the gospel through, uh, through the earth as in, in this post-millennial hope. Um, the gospel will conquer the earth as the water cover the sea. Moscow and each of your hometowns are just pit stops along the way as the gospel marches to its full fruition. But, it, but if you are set on that, if you are set on, on that actually happening, not just being an idea in your head, but th this thing actually happening, if you're set on actual world transformation rather than just disembodied academic propositions about the gospel, then you must steal yourself for the conflict conflict as you actually engage with the enemy. Because you see, you, you can sit and at the dry erase board uh, and talk about the X's and O's of your offensive strategy in a, in a sort of um, disembodied, dispassionate, logical sort of way. But the lineman who actually intends to run the play has to develop a whole other set of skills in dealing with what happens up close and personal in real conflict. He has to deal with cheap shots that the ref never sees, with language that is shared when no microphone picks it up. There's a whole other world that is going on down there that has nothing to do with the X's and O's back on, on that dry erase um, board. That is theoretical, and this is something you have to learn if you're going to get into the actual. When you move from the theoretical to the practical, a whole new set of skills come into play. And because Doug is trying to bring internal personal regeneration out into the world, that the world might be transformed, there is necessary a lot of work that needs to be done in coaching evangelicals to understand what it looks like when worldviews world views collide. Um, and more importantly, what it looks like to both survive and even triumph in that collision. Um, there's, a, there's a little product placement collision. It's, it's a movie, uh, not a book, but I'm sneaking it in and as a good example of this. Um, I do think that because evangelicals have privatized their faith by focusing solely on private internal regeneration, they are fairly clueless about how to navigate the moment of actual external cultural collision. And I would argue that a lot of Doug's work on trying to cultivate a taste for smash mouth rhetorical strategy books, um, books like uh, Serrated Edge or Rules for Reformers, also mentioned earlier. Um, these are all about getting evangelicals to quit practicing their shadow boxing and to actually learn to engage unbelief. So think of, think of that spicy rhetorical project as the, the big beefy chain that helps to tie credenda to agenda and link them together. If you want this to become an agenda, you got to have a big uh, beefy chain like that to pull through. And I think that's what that spicy kind of rhetoric is. I hope this is a helpful um, big picture orientation to what I think is the most important thread going through Moscow's many publications. It's simply old school, hot gospel, evangelical, Holy Spirit driven individual regeneration flowing out to transform every aspect of life. All of Christ for all of life for all the world. That's the slogan. It's evangelical post-millennialism. Thank you.